Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, How to Secure Your IT Infrastructure and Build a Rock Solid Network. I'm Joel Anderson, the VP of Marketing for Tier 4 Advisors, and look forward to presenting today's session, where we'll be hearing from our security uh, expert security panel. First, today's webinar will be recorded and made available after this session, along with the contact information of uh, our panelists. And second, we'd love to hear from you today. If you have any uh, questions related to security, best practices, ask our panel and our, and our moderator, Nikki. We'd be, love to be able to uh, facilitate those questions as best as we can into today's webinar. So with that said, Nikki, I will turn the time over to you and our panel. Well, thank you, Joel, so much. My name is Nikki Rayburn. I'm the Executive Director of Professional Services and Cybersecurity for Tier 4 Group, which is the sister company to Tier 4 Advisors. It is great to be here and certainly to be surrounded by this panel. Um, I would not do justice trying to introduce the backgrounds of each of my panelists, so I'm going to let them do it and provide a much better story than the one that I could tell. Uh, and it's okay if you want to embellish and tell a little bit of a story. Dominique, I'll start with you. Why don't you introduce yourself for our guests? Oh, sure. So I'm Dominic Singer, Vice President of Business Development for uh, Cybersecurity at Telaris. We are a master agent where we have a suite of a lot of great suppliers that sell security solutions. My whole focus is all about being practical and bringing uh, the right solutions to our customers' tables. And so we always think about customer first. A uh, quick bit of my history, I'm gonna go into it for about 25 minutes. Of course, that's a joke, you don't know me, I'm secure, <laughs> I'm to dry. I uh, started on a tricycle at about five years old, maybe six, I can't remember exactly. Uh, but no, the short version is I was in the military, spent my time running battlefield communication systems, spent many years uh, supporting the uh, Disney online operations. So all of their environments, supporting the cruise engines, ESPN, so on and so forth and then many years on the uh, consultant and sales side of the house as well. So really just a broad experience about how to help customers be approaching security with a smart perspective. Ooh, I'm glad I thought maybe you were going to tell a story and do a little bit of embellishment there, but that's great. I love the military um, pers perspective in cyber as well, so that's really cool about your background. Mark, why don't you introduce yourself to our guests? Sure, I'm uh, Mark Punzarudu. I'm the Vice President of Professional Services at Control Scan. Uh, so we manage compliance and security for uh, quite a few merchant service providers and other organizations around the U.S. But my primary focus is over top of uh, penetration testing, red teaming, and physical security assessments, and all the compliant the uh, compliance and information security framework acronyms that no one wants to talk about on a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And Gray, I'm so glad we just for everyone's, um, you know, benefit, I feel, feel like it's important to say that uh, in these times of COVID and remote working, uh, sometimes AV things tend to happen. And so I'm glad that Gray, you were able to come back. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Gray Wolf. I am the uh, practice director for regulatory compliance and cybersecurity within the tier four group of companies, specifically uh, Tier 4 Group, and uh, my role in the organization is helping advise uh, customers and people in the general public on how to safely comply with regulations related to uh, their business, and also how to manage and operate cybersecurity programs uh, that meet the requirements of insurers and federal regulators. Thank you so much, and last but certainly not least, Chip. You have a wonderful perspective to provide today. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Great. Uh, I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at Thrive Networks. We're a managed service provider as well as uh, an SSB. Uh, so we've been in business for over 15 years. I've uh, been growing fairly rapidly. Uh, and we take care of our customers anywhere from desktop support to uh, security, uh, SIM monitoring, et cetera. Um, my background is mostly in defense for security, uh, and that's what um, mostly what I'll be talking about today. Good. So let's kind of get right into it, and I'm going to pose this this first question. You know, we the title of the webinar is how to secure your IT infrastructure, and as we started to think about the the topic and what we wanted to cover, the whole notion of you know, cyber is getting more sophisticated. Obviously, the, the number of tools and solutions um, that are coming to play in this industry, it's exploding. And yet, there might be some value in terms of trying to get back to basics and thinking about, you know, what are some of the, the fundamentals that maybe we don't talk about often enough? So, 
With that in mind, I want to start this first question. Dominique, I think this is probably a perfect one suited to you just because of your role and all of the different um, solutions that you do bring to your clients. But what are some of the foundational layers of defense that an organization might want to be putting in place in their organization? Whether they're coming at cyber from an infrastructure um, vantage point, which lots of companies do, there are still companies today that do not have formalized cybersecurity organizations, or if it's a, a, a beginning nascent cyber organization that's saying, you know, we have the org, org chart, but um, we certainly know we have a lot to build. What are some of those foundational pieces uh, that they need to be putting in place? Uh, so that's a really big question. It'll take a few minutes to answer, but I'm going to be as brief as possible. So when I think about foundation, right, I'm going to get into a little bit of philosophy for a second. I think that the foundation needs to start with a mindset and that mindset needs to be a shift away from, we think we can build a great protection empire and keep everybody out. In my view, the mindset should now be, and this is about foundation, right? The foundation, foundational mindset should be, let's assume we're going to be compromised. How quickly can we identify it, respond to it, and recover from it? Because in there, you really are going to drive your overall cybersecurity strategy. More specifically, I would say it should start with a risk assessment, risk management understanding. Organizations have said, yeah, we did risk assessments you know, four or five years ago. We've got our plan in place. Risks and threats change over time. That should be a living, breathing program where you define those critical assets, then you define the likelihood that they could get impacted, what that impact would mean to your organization, and from there you drive your security strategy. I would say that's the foundation before building any of the other tools and components that we talk about when we get into layered security from endpoint all the way to the edge. And uh, with that brief answer, I'll hand it over to my esteemed colleagues. Yeah, no, that's a, that is a great response. Chip, as a CISO, how would you respond to that as well? I actually, uh, I, I totally agree with Dominique on that one. He's, he's right on par. You really need to know where you're at before you start moving forward. One of the, the areas where I see most companies running into problems is they try to jump to the top before they've done the basics. Like they're not even patching before they, they, they're, they're monitoring, right? We're going to do vulnerability management before we've done scanning. So we really need to hit those basics. Um, and, and as Dominique said, if you have an understanding of your risks and where you're at now, you can start putting those, those uh, building blocks in place to move forward. So Mark, from your vantage point, serving a lot of different customers, and, and I know you all do, but just kind of putting the consultant's hat on, you know, what, are, what would you add to that in terms of a foundation? Because as much as we say this is the way that we should be doing it. Um, a lot of times people are still a little reactive. So I'd love to kind of get your comments that if an organization's in that reactive mode, right, what, what can they do to kind of stop and think about basic blocking and tackling and what would that look like? Yeah, so I, I mean, all the good answers were taken, uh, the risk-based <laughs> approach and everything else. Um, those are all entire, I completely agree. And a lot of organizations who, perhaps aren't mature enough to have the ability to do formal risk management. <clears throat> Relying on a third party sometimes is important. Um, I, I'm an odd consultant. I come from the other side of the table. So I, I, I used to sit in bad mouth consultants all day um, before coming to the dark side. But, you know, sometimes there is a, a time and place where that makes sense. But also before you're jumping on the next bandwagon, you know, the next big marketing trend, stop and assess what you actually have and take stock first because most of the issues related to basic blocking and tackling can be done with stuff you already have you're just not using it effectively or efficiently um, implement acls in your firewalls and infrastructure and security groups you know these are probably devices you already have and just aren't managing properly so take stock of the maturity of how all that's been managed and see how much you can do with what you already have I love it. I, I love it because I do think that um, we get distracted by the, the, the latest logo or, and, and we all have logos, right? We all get it. And we've got things that we can offer around value, but having that strategic perspective is so important. So, okay. So if we're thinking about cyber as a program and not necessarily as a tool, I want to talk a little bit now um, about in constrained times, 
you know, of, of budgets that are decreasing, you know, cyber, everybody complains about how cyber is getting all the love and the funding within an organization and then the CISOs will say it's never enough. Um, but, but when those budgets are constrained, because seriously, I think that that is what everyone is kind of experiencing now. How do you, you know, how would you go about formalizing, prioritizing one tool or one initiative over another? Um, Chip, I'll throw that question back to you. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and I'm actually going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about what Dominique said before, which was understanding, you know, where you're at now. And um, one of the things that we need to look at or companies look at is where the risks are. What are the quote unquote crown jewels that you're trying to protect? What's most important to your company? If you don't know what that is, you're not going to be able to have a good solution put in place. So if you're looking for for example, penetration testing, should I do that versus vulnerability management versus you know, SIM monitoring? It's hard to know which would be best until you understand what you're trying to protect. Once you know what you're trying to protect, then you can decide where you want to put that money and what's most effective for your organization. Oh, that's a great point. And, I, and I'm going to go off script a little bit because I, I love that conversation, though, about risk. <laughs> that, that really wasn't in any of the formal discussion points that we thought about. But Mark, I'll throw that back to you. So what is, I'll throw it to you and then Gray, I'd love for you to chime in as well. Because when you think about risk, right, how hard is it to get the business to think about business risk and then to say, these are people and process and technologies that I need to put in place um, to be able to mitigate those risks? What, what does that look like for the clients that you serve? Oh, getting getting buy-in is easily the hardest thing for them to do. Uh, but it's it's often difficult because communicating that information upstream to people who have different goals, objectives, KPIs is, is pretty difficult. Um, you know, there is an art to it. You put you always put things in the terms that others appreciate them for. Uh, so you're talking to a board of directors. It's money and numbers. You know, it's. I need to assign some level of risk to prioritize these things, talk about what the exposure is in dollars, talk about what the cost is to mitigate it in dollars. Um, so you have to speak in a language that people understand. <clears throat> but I, I think when, it, when you talk about making risk-based decisions in that kind of environment, it's also important to get through. It's not about raising the bar of your entire information security program. You can do a risk assessment and have everything at a two uh, on a scale one to nine or you know one to 10. Your goal is not to get everything to a three. It's, it might be to get some things, or I'm sorry, get them down to a zero. It might be to get some things down to a one. A three or a four might be okay on other things. So again, understanding what you have to protect and why you have to protect it. Um, you know, and things that factor into that could be compliance obligations. It could be anything. It could be you know, privacy regulations, regulatory compliance. It could be internal intellectual property and what happens to your company if that data gets breached. You know, obviously, the recipe for Coca-Cola or the spices for KFC, uh, they're going to protect those a lot more critically than you would some text file on an end user workstation. So it's about raising the bar in certain areas to the extent that it's required, not about spending money to blanket sim your entire infrastructure. Yeah, and you bring up a good point too around compliance. And, and Gray, I think this is a great place for you to kind of enter in because a lot of companies want to use compliance as, you know, whether it's the the hammer or the carrot, right? They're trying to use that as the reason to do some of these things. And you and I have had these conversations as to whether or not they'll have much success. Um, but comment on that for a minute, if you will. I think that when we look at compliance and, and almost every compliance framework, some kind of risk analysis. And as you begin to look at risk, you have to start at the core of the systems that your business relies on and move out from there. Risk doesn't all live inside the firewall. Uh, you need to have a good inventory of what data you have, where it's stored, and what systems can access it, and then what, what users can access those systems. Um, because the consequence of failing a risk abatement program in, in a uh, regulatory framework is catastrophic for a business. You know, you're looking at 4% uh, of global turnover per incident for a violation under GDPR. 25 of them, and that's your operating budget for the year. So being able to manage those very closely is important. 
And I believe that good risk management starts with a good inventory and understanding of what systems are in your environment and how they're managed. Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole, you know, the people in process on top of that, which is so important. So, Dominic, you're the one that talked about the assessment component, right? And so the assessment ultimately leads to creating that strategy. So what are some of the things that you think companies are leaving out of their strategies? I mean, I guess the, the, the two biggest questions I think of, and we've kind of hit on it, is do you think companies really do a good job of documenting, understanding, and socializing what their crown jewels really are? Or do you think that's still a mystery to some degree? And then on the back end of that, are they really having the conversations around the people and process that surrounds those systems that are impacting those, those important assets? Uh, so it's, it, you know, it, it's a big question, right? There's a lot that goes into that. I mean, I, I'll back into it a little bit differently. Uh, you know, the, the thing that I would say that organizations possibly are missing, and then, you know, Chip can speak to this because that's what he delivers as a service, it's a feedback loop. You know, when you're putting a security program in place, it means a lot more than just putting point solutions together and then trying to stitch some weave around that and then think you've got a decent security posture. There should be a feedback loop. There should always be a learning mechanism. You know, Mark talked about, you know, risk across the entire enterprise at being level set, right? This idea of good security means you have the mindset that there's no such thing as perfect security. It's always this march towards getting better. And so what that really means is that, you know, holistically across the enterprise, yes, compliance can be a driver for getting good budget and building good security programs, but it can get singularly focused in certain areas where you leave the low hanging fruit unprotected or it's not as you know, highly secure, if you will. So you know, kind of the way I'd back into that question is that it's really about this idea of a feedback loop that, you know, how do we continuously improve our security posture? When we identify we've had a compromise, how, you know, where do we, do we identify where protection failed? Are there some changes we can make in our protective posture? Did we detect it in a timely manner? Are there changes we need to make around our detection capabilities? The same thing for response and recovery. And all of that is to imply that, to your point, people, processes, and technology is the crux of a solid cybersecurity program. And you know, maybe you don't have the internal people, you certainly can't afford to have the right number of security staff to do it operationally like an organization like Thrive, for example, that offers it as a managed service. So buying mature people processes and technology as a service might be a more effective spend of cash. Now, I know that didn't quite answer your question, but I just wanted to kind of put that on the table there. Yeah, no, I think it's great. And Chip, I would love for you to comment on that because I do think that you have something unique to offer. And, and it does go hand in hand with, in terms of as you're building a program and you're putting a strategy in place, um, you know, the, the original question was, what are companies leaving out of their strategies? But I think that really does dovetail into, you know, what you bring to market to be able to help them. Right. And that's, it's interesting because if you look at five years ago, we'd go into a company as a, as a, a managed service provider and the internal IT people were very, were not very happy to see us because they always felt like we might be taking their job. Now, when we go into a company, a lot of the internal IT people see us as partners instead of, instead of adversaries, because we might not say we're taking over your, your server infrastructure. We're just augmenting your IT infrastructure you know, either with security or with patching or whatever you might need. And so that's where, um, you know, five years ago, it was uh, the one IT person or the two IT people in a company were doing everything. And now we just can't do that anymore. It's just not possible. Um, and then as Gray will say, you know, once we start pulling compliance into it, it gets very complex, right? And, and when you, you know, when you look at compliance, you need to have a whole bunch of systems in place to make sure you're doing the right thing. And if you have two people trying to do all that, you're going to fail. Right. Um, and it's, and, and you're setting them up for failure. And it's not, it's not good for the company. It's not good for those people because they're going to quit. And it's not good, you know, it's not good overall. So that's where, you know, companies like Thrive and, and we're come in and we're help you out with whatever portion that you might need to, to finish up with. Yeah, so so let's switch then and let's talk a little bit about um, defending an organization against cyber threats and and monitoring, right? And, and Chip, I'll, I'll, because you've got the, the MSSP, you know, kind of perspective and we've just been talking about that. When companies are looking at, well, what do I need to monitor? What, what do I need to monitor either from an infrastructure perspective or an application? You know, 
I guess the question is, how would you answer that? And then what's the, what's the conversation that you take them through to be able to prioritize um, what that really needs to be for that company? Right. And we had these conversations a lot because some companies were going in and they say, we want to monitor everything. Okay. Right. Well, that's not realistic. Okay. Right. There, you have, you have a ton of stuff and we're not, we're not monitoring the workstation, you know, or maybe will if it's the CEOs, but it really depends on what, you know, again, we're talking risk, but one of the things that is tough is when we start talking monitoring, usually we're talking about uh, security incident event management, which is uh, SIM. When we start talking about that, we want to start looking at, uh, you know, setting it up and, and monitoring specific things. A lot of companies say, oh, I have John or Jane who know how to, they did this once before and they're going to set this up. There's a lot of care and feeding involved. It's not just set it and kind of forget it, which was, again, what people used to do five, 10 years ago. You set up a firewall and it was blocking me. Well, no, not anymore. You have to keep it updated. Same thing with the SIM. If somebody's attacking you and nobody's monitoring it or you don't have it tuned correctly, then, then you're actually not getting good data. So that's where Thrive comes in. We look at what your overall infrastructure looks, at, uh, looks like. We're going to take a look at what's most important to you that we have to protect. We're going to really focus on that and then expand outwards. So make sure we have the core stuff really well monitored and then we're going to slowly expand out so we, then we can continually work on your, your security posture. Yeah, no, very well said, very, very well said. And I think, I think companies, um, I'm seeing them start to think and, and look for that advice as well as think, instead of thinking, well, aren't we just gonna monitor everything? We're gonna get every single data feed we possibly can, because you're right, it doesn't really work. Dominique, I'll ask you uh, to comment on the same question. I mean, are you seeing companies taking similar approaches where they're, they're seeking that advice or are you having to, you know, as you're recommending solutions, kind of have that prioritization conversation a little bit and, and do more of the educating with your customers. Yeah, for sure. And so let me just give a plug for organizations like Mark's, right? Uh, the, this, and I had the vantage point of being able to talk to customers without coming at it from a supplier perspective. And one of the most valuable things that I see and that I recommend organizations is that they should absolutely be bringing in outside consultants for a number of reasons. They have expertise, maybe within their specific industry, but across industries and they have years of experience and they can do it and they can advise how to do things much more efficiently and much more effectively and pragmatically. So I just wanted to put that on the table that organizations really should be looking to outside consultants to help them. And, and it's not a threat, you know, Chip had mentioned this earlier, whether it's an MSSP coming in to offer services and make them more efficient in their daily operations, or whether it's bringing in a consultant to help them understand how to drive the security strategy, you have to look at that as a true, truly effective use of spending your cybersecurity budget. So taking it a step further on the point that Chip was making, you know, when we look at organizations and we're talking to all sorts of industries across the board, you know, they, they frankly can't afford to have the right number of security staff. The ones that they have tend to get too bogged down in the day-to-day -day war fighting. And really, they should be looking at leveraging these service providers, and whether it's a consultant, whether it's an MSSP, to help them become more efficient. Because you, know, you can't solve the cybersecurity problem in your own little vacuum. You certainly can't go out and look at the marketplace and listen to a bunch of marketing hype telling you that this is the latest and greatest product that you need to buy. And once you buy the solution, you're going to have awesome, perfect security, and you're going to find the holy grail. It just doesn't exist. That's where you can leverage consultancy. That's where you can leverage certain service providers to really help you make the best use of the way you're spending your cash. So, um, you know, a lot more I could answer on that, but I hope that kind of answered your question. Yeah, no, and, and you brought up a couple of points around, you know, buzzwords and, cyber, and you know, you're gonna have the perfect security program. You know, it's, this, it's almost this nature or notion that you are gonna make the investment and you're done. <laughs> you don't have to think about it again. and and. So I will say, and, and I think I'm okay saying this, um, but let's talk about AI because AI is a little bit of that marketing, you know, it's a cool promise. The technology is there. Don't get me wrong. But I do think that some people are going, oh, I'm just going to make everything AI driven and then I'm not going to have to worry about it anymore. And so, Gray, let me throw that to you because I know we had a recent conversation about this as well. Like what, 
how realistic is AI? Is it really going to make a whole having to worry about cyber threats obsolete and take care of it for us? So there's a couple of uh, factors at play there. I I'm a big fan of AI as, a, as an augmentation to human staff. Uh, you look at a, a SIM, look at a, a, a good solid SIM product, it's going to generate tens of thousands of alerts and monitoring notes a day. You have this tsunami of data and you have to get some valuable information out of it. AI can be your frontline filter that only escalates the things that you actually need to see because they're unique or because they don't happen often or because they have some kind of code that triggers an alert. AI is not the ultimate solution for everything because once you have that information, a decision on action has to be made. Now, inside the new CMMC uh, compliance program for the military, that action has to be taken at machine speed. So that all old model of something happened last night, let's meet together at 10 o'clock and discuss it, and then figure out what we're going to do inside the next change control is not gonna work anymore. The AI is going to have to work with the human staff in order to trigger actions to respond to threats almost in real time, but at machine speed means that it's responding at a digital computerized rate of action. So uh, the niceties of change control models and the niceties of the morning IT security meeting has got to end um, because we know that what we see in the cybersecurity programs from the military leak into the public space and those become, become the de facto. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and I'll, at the risk of going off script again, I'd love to chip your nodding your head there. I mean, what's your thought on AI? And is that something that you guys are making an investment in from a product perspective? Yeah, so there's, um, there's a lot more uh, going on now in the sim space with orchestration. And that's, so you're seeing attack on your firewall and that tax comes from whatever country or whatever IP you can have it automatically block it on the firewall, right? So as Gray mentions, you know, machine speeds, this can happen and it can, and it can go and it can automatically block it. Now, in some cases, we don't want to do that right away. We like to have a human involved. In some cases, it depends on the client. Again, I, while this is, we weren't talking about risk, it all comes down to risk, whether where the client fits in. It could be a compliance risk by not following this rule, or it could be another risk. So that's where you, we, we have these conversations, but absolutely this is what is happening now. And, and it's gonna, as Gray mentioned, this is gonna be leaking in more and more into the standard procedures of IT organizations. No, that's really good. So I, I wanna switch a little bit. We were talking about people in process and one of the, um, for our infrastructure folks out there as well, um, to, I wanna talk about patching, right? And, and, and critical infrastructure. And Mark, I'm gonna throw this to you. Um, why, you know, we do the vulnerability scans, like the processes are there. We know what we need to go patch. And, and this isn't just old news. I mean, this is just, it happens every single week, I feel like, is some of the patches just don't get done, right? And so why, why is that? Why is that so hard? What are companies doing to try to get a little bit more, using the Dom, Dominique's phrase of the feedback loop, right? What, what's happening there and how is it improving? So I, I think the whole thing has a root cause uh, that I like to rant about from time to time, and that's that no real compliance mandate enforces formal um, system development life cycles. I mean, FISMA touches on it, a few odds and ends, but there's no widespread uh, pandemic of compliance that makes people have to manage a system develop a system maintenance life cycle. Um, so it's you know deprecation of an asset when it, when it goes end of life. Um, it all, all boils down to asset management. At least that's from my perspective. When I go into an organization, they're missing patches because one, they didn't know that this operating system on the Cisco firewall was going end of life next year. Well, they should have because they, they installed the one that they have. So, you know, that's something that I think no one really keeps track of. They rely on scans and when people have time to get things done to go check that sort of thing or preparing for a third party compliance assessment of some sort. 
you know, these things get uncovered. Um, so I think it really goes back to asset management on my side of it. And I do look at it a little bit. I, I'd say I have some strong feelings around it. I hear downtime a lot. <clears throat> there are a few scenarios where downtime is a big deal. And I could see that you have to schedule your patching accordingly, you know, big production databases that are too expensive to pair and to offload or something along those lines. But number one, it's a good time to test your DR. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> if, you, if you don't have DR, if that's not a problem, then uh, I could see why you have downtime. But um, most of the time I find that the downtime is really an excuse for lack of resources, not knowing what needs to be patched, or they've had, they've maybe been burned before because they're not testing patches before rolling them into production. So they're a little bit gun shy. Um, you actually, I see this the most, you think operating systems and firewalls and stuff like that, those are the obvious ones. But I actually see more of this now in application code where people don't have an inventory of open source libraries and other stuff they're using within their custom code. And then that becomes its own, uh, actually much more significant deal than some infrastructure usually. But uh, yeah, with that, I'll turn it over to someone else. A few folks probably have some strong opinions on patching. Well, I like that rant. I think it's good. And it's funny because I, I an empathetic moment um, that I had a few months ago is, you know, you, you have the phone, the, the update, right? It says, hey, there's an update. Hey, you ought to do this. Hey, you ought to do this. And I keep hitting remind me later, remind me later until the phone finally takes over there, or <laughs> somebody pushes it out and says, I'm going to save you from yourself. <laughs> You're not going to be able to use your phone. And i when that happened, I thought, oh, maybe that's what, that's like the next thing for patching, kidding, all, really, but, uh, but well, it is similar, so I think that's a good rant for sure. Yeah, and you do have to take into considerations, I mean, all patches are important, not all patches are created equal, um, you know, there are certain things that need immediate consideration, but, you know, plan a time once a month to knock out all the normal stuff and, and keep it on your schedule, and, and it all right. should be pretty well. Yeah, the discipline. Gray, you were going to say something. Yeah, I think that the, the patching conversation, uh, as, as we've sort of poked at a little bit, touches on a larger infrastructure conversation about business continuity and disaster recovery. Uh, you know, when you look at a, a situation where a company is updating a Windows 2012 server that has Cisco, or I'm sorry, that has SQL 2012 R2 on it, there are a whole battery of patches that can't be applied to that device. And if they get applied, a business continuity situation is going to come into play. We have a customer that uh, got a new infrastructure manager and she went nuts with um, rolling out patches to all the servers and effectively soured the, the uh, server services because so many of the services got patches installed that should have been excluded. But when you're looking at an organization that has 200 servers and has not been patched in a while, there can be thousands of patches that need to be applied to applications, to operating systems, to underlying CMOS and um, other underlying platforms on servers, but also inside a Cisco or uh, other infrastructure devices. And then you start getting into conflicts with the new patch doesn't support excluding that port and you know, all the various scenarios. So this is not a recreational activity that the help guest desk can do at night. This is, uh, this is heavy lifting that an IT professional with infrastructure background needs to be focused on. Yeah, and Nikki, I'm sure, oh, pardon me. Go ahead, no, 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 well, I was just gonna say it's that debt, right? It's that technical, it's security debt that we accumulate and, and eventually you're gonna have to pay the piper. But anyway, Dominique, please continue. Well, I'm sure Chip has got some great thoughts on this because yeah. it's a sweet spot for him, but I just wanted to you know, jump back into philosophy and what we talked about earlier, you know, people, processes, and technology. And I, I harp on this because this really is the crux, right? I don't care if you buy great point solutions. If you don't have the right people governed by the right processes, it's not a good security program. You can have lesser great solutions, better processes, better people, and you have a more effective security posture. I'll give a really specific example that anyone can go out there and research because it's publicly available. You can read the 72-page Senate report, if I remember the numbers right, on Equifax, right? Their breach... Why did it happen? Because they didn't have the right people involved in the patch process. They had the right technology. They had great experts. They had executives that kind of looked at it as more of a routine Monday and exercise. But the system owner of the system that got compromised wasn't even involved in the patch process. And let me get more specific on my philosophy. Back to the security professionals and the limited use of time that they have. 
this is a it is a fundamentally vital program of security program but it should be a routine that they hand off to a service provider that knows how to deliver on a customized basis and can do it method, method, methodically and across the organization and free up that security professional's time away from it. And the reason I'm saying this is because I used to be part of these programs and I get that you built your security program around this idea of patching and vulnerability management and you're calling that your security program. That's one tiny little crux. And that highly paid resource, that security professional should be focusing, in my opinion, should be focusing their time and effort in other places than dealing with patch management. Yeah, and that is so hard. Chip, I would love for you to comment on that because I think it can be challenging for some infrastructure teams to think that their cyber partners can be partners in terms of helping to prioritize and guide and provide that feedback loop that Dominique talked about. I mean, I mean do you have some, some perspective and experience to share on that? Yeah, so normally we win over the IT people at a company by telling them we're taking over the patching because nobody wants to patch. Like nobody does. It's, it's a horrendous activity. It's in the middle of the night. It always goes wrong. And then they're up until three in the morning with Microsoft trying to fix it and they don't want to be there. They'd rather push it on to somebody else, right? We have a patching team. That's all they do is patch. And we have tens of thousands of machines that we patch every month. And we're, we actually had a, a call just earlier today about the new DNS zero day that came out yesterday that we have to worry about patching and how we're going to do it and what we're going to do. And we test everything before we do it. Um, and with certain clients, we are do a, a rollout of a subset of machines to make sure everything's good. And, and, and that's how we design a patch process. So it, it allows us to take over that portion of it. And since we do so many machines, if something's going wrong, we're going to know pretty quick and we're not going to keep rolling it out. So it allows us to, to understand what's going on within the entire infrastructure of all our clients and allows us to make sure we patch correctly for everybody. No, that's really good. That's, that's, um, that's great. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very valuable to have a partner who can, who can provide that oversight and insight, right? It's the yeah. same. So I, uh, I know I've gone so off script. I'm going to, do it a tiny bit, but I want to kind of end what I think will be our last question because I'd love for you all to talk about it. We've talked about technology. We've talked about process. I want to focus a little bit on the people. Um, Chip, you made a com comment earlier that in just terms of talking about it, and the, the image that I conjured up is people in a cyber world are stressed out, right? I mean, it's your you're worried, you're not able to get to everything. There's never enough people on a cyber team. I mean, everybody has some of the same constraints. And this is, this is they're responsible for, for the cyber security health of a business. So how, I would love maybe to start with you, Chip, um, and mm -hmm. then we'll go around Robin to Dominique, Mark, and then Gray. But from, a, from a managing the people part and helping them stay engaged, you know, this is all going to be a huge part of making sure that we can stabilize our cyber workforces and keep people in it. So how are we caring, caring and feeding for the people that are on the front lines of cyber? So I know personally, I have, I have a number of people who report to me who are, who are obviously analysts and engineers that, that are the front lines of all of this. They're all extremely passionate about it. People, you know, people who are in this business don't, you know, they're in it because they love what they do. They want to, especially the people who work for me, they really want to protect our clients and make sure their clients are secure and they have the best solutions in place for them. Um, a lot of that is training and giving them access to the good training to go into conferences, uh, giving them time to be able to, to grow within the organization and not uh, pinching, holding them into one specific area. Uh, one of the things that I know for, for ourselves being an MSP, we see a lot of different types of technology. Um, you know, that's where sometimes an internal IT person, um, we, we get a lot of people who apply to, to uh, our, our organization from, from internal positions because they want to see more, they want to grow more. Um, and that's where for, for us, it makes it almost easier to, to hire people because they can, they, they get to put their hands in a lot of different pots, let's say. Yeah, no, that's really good. That exposure is important. Dominique, what are you seeing? Uh, so I'm seeing a lot of different things, but I'm again going to whack some philosophy here and uh, kind of be my same old broken record. 
Um, but before I do, I just want to, you know, for, I know we've got you know, your customers out there and tier four does a lot of really cool stuff. You know, I, I, I just have to respectfully say, right, that hiring process, there are, because, you know, there is a, a dearth of good security professionals in the industry, they are constantly recruited. They're really good ones that are effective. And so going through the hiring process, right, you really should do some, some good scrutiny, scrutinizing around their background and their expertise, because it's easy to say, you know, you've got some certifications and you pass some tests, but do you have the real experience of knowing what it means to even implement anything that you're talking about? So the hiring practice has to be pretty rigid. Taking it a step further, back to my broken record, keeping those security professionals actively engaged and intrigued in their job will mean you have a happy employee and that you'll keep them on board. And to Chip's point about training, you know, understanding the aptitude of that employee, where they're at, where they should go, and helping drive sort of their vision. You know, yes, maybe today they like to tweak the knobs and dials, but helping them understand down the road, maybe it makes more sense to think about privacy, right, and data protection and all the nuances involved in that world, or maybe identity management, and leapfrogging away from what they love to do today, and, and really understanding, in my view, and probably everybody on this call here, you know, what we see as trends in the industry is absolutely a motion towards leveraging service providers, because again, they offer that managed service, if you will, of buying the people, processes, and technology. You've got maturity that you can buy as a service. And so if we can make that assumption that that's a better approach, and then we as the security professional inside the organization are managing those service providers, managing that experience and consuming the intelligence off those platforms and systems that we're buying, and we're helping the organizations make more informed decisions. Now as a security professional, I feel like I have more of a vested interest in my organization and more of a basically a seat at that leadership table. And yes, I understand they still need to be in the nuances of understanding the technical architecture, all that kind of stuff. There is a place for that. But uh, I would just suggest that really leveraging the outside consultants and service providers to help augment your team and your expertise will help you feel more comfortable in your role in doing the more cool stuff. Well, I appreciate that. And I think we'll leave it there because that's kind of the oh. mic drop for our consultants. <laughs> Gray and Mark, uh, I think that's beautifully said and certainly um, what we can provide uh, collectively to the people that are on the call. Joel, I'll turn it back to you because I know that uh, you have probably have some reminders that you want to make uh, to bring it all home. Sure, appreciate it, Nikki. Thank you to our panel. Nikki, thank you as well for moderating. And thanks to those uh, who joined us for today's conversation. If any of you would like to learn more about ways in which you can se uh, secure your business, feel free to visit tier4advisors.com or tier4group.com or reach out to a tier four advisors team member and we'd be happy to uh, facilitate a conversation there. Make sure to join us next week, Wednesday, July 22nd, 2 p.m. Eastern, as we will be discussing how to transform your business with copy data virtualization. So another great conversation to put on your radar. So we'll see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Take care.